In 1900, the legal working age was eight years old. Women did not have the right to vote, and 50% of them remained unmarried. Participation in public life was frowned upon by the Catholic Church, and women were excluded from political parties and cultural societies. There was one woman who rose above the restrictions of the time, Maud Gaughan. Maud Gaughan was already a well-known anti-British activist. When she tried to gain membership of the National Land League, she was told it was an open organization in which the ladies would not take part. I think it was Parnell who said, England's gifts to Ireland were workhouses, prisons, and lunatic asylums. Evictions I saw in 1885 changed the whole course of my life, transforming me from a carefree society girl into a woman of set purpose. I was determined to do my share to free Ireland from the British Empire. The wholesale destruction of the little houses of the people by battering rams was going on all over the country. 360,000 people were evicted from their little homes under Queen Victoria. Stones and boiling water were no match for guns. Maud Gaughan was not an Irish woman by birth. She had come to Ireland as a child when her father, a captain in the British Army, was posted here. After fleeing to France to avoid arrest for her activities, She'd published a broadsheet about colonial repression and the loss of Irish identity. Like many creative and political thinkers of her era, she believed that the mindset of Ireland had to change. The Celtic revival had begun. The Celtic Literary Society, founded by Willie Rooney, like all political organizations of those days, excluded women from membership. But they invited me to lecture for them. So I used the opportunity of asking if they really thought Mother Ireland strong enough to go into battle with one arm tied behind her back, which was what this exclusion of women from political life meant, and suggested that they should invite their sisters and sweethearts to meet me in their room in Abbey Street, and we would form a woman's organization for national independence. A few days after, I met some 14 sisters and sweethearts, all young, inexperienced in political work, but all loving Ireland and eager to work for her. What can we do? England is preventing our language and our history being taught in the schools. We could start free classes to teach the children subjects forbidden in the schools. English is trying to get Irishmen to enlist in her army. We could start an anti-recruiting campaign. Before a year was out, we had three centers in Dublin, teaching history, Irish, music, and dancing. That was how Inenia Nahairton started. As well as the political work, Miss Gunn always wanted the social side of things attended to. Well, at that time, there was great poverty in Dublin. Because a working man working anything up to 60 hours, he earned 14 or 15 shillings a week and had to keep a family on that. And she got the idea in France for school dinners. It was a dinner of stew and vegetables and potatoes, hot. They cooked it and sent it up in cauldrons in a little class that we heard to the school. And the teachers and we all, the members of Anini, went up and served the children. We forbid the word charity to be used in connection with them. And each child was expected to pay a penny, but no one knew whether the child next to them had or had not the penny. Ireland in 1900 was part of the British Empire, with all the emblems that that entailed. The British military patrolled the capital, occupying one side of O'Connell Street, the GPO side. They dazzled young women in their military uniforms. Inyinia Naharan set about dissuading young girls from stepping out with British soldiers. 
they also campaigned against local boys joining the occupying army. Our anti-enlistment campaign was so successful that it brought Queen Victoria to Ireland to stimulate recruiting, which obliged us to start another campaign to stop official welcomes to English royal visitors. We held a great demonstration, but failed to prevent Queen Victoria receiving the keys of the city of Dublin. But we succeeded in preventing Edward VII receiving them when he visited Dublin after his coronation. Maud Gawn had written an article on Queen Victoria called The Famine Queen. The day before Victoria's arrival in Dublin, it was published in The United Irishman. The paper was seized and Maud Gawn was removed with physical force. On the day before the arrival of King Edward, Gone was busy leafleting the streets again. And when she arrived home, she was so disgusted with her neighbor's display of Union Jacks and bunting that she broke a broom and made her own flag. Another young woman disgusted by the display of flunkyism was 19-year-old Helena Maloney. That evening, she decided to join Inina Naheran. So I went down in 1903 to their offices in Pierce Street, and I found them closed, but on the door was um, a message in pencil, read on Maud Gunn's house. On the door was um, a message in pencil, read on Maud Gunn's house, Colson Avenue, come up, all of you. So I at once went up to Colson Avenue in the front, and there I saw, at her house, a, a row of policemen looking very threateningly. The, the lawn, the little lawn, was filled with the members of the Nini, all girls. And she had had a black flag out. There was a, a visit of some loyal function going on in the city at the time. And it was a counterblast to the decorations of Union Jacks and so on. So I went in to the lawn, I was admitted, but I, they, I was unknown for them, you see, and the girls looked at me very suspiciously. Despite their suspicions, Helena persisted, going on to become a central figure in Hanina and Heron. Later, Helena Maloney recalled, I walked home on air, really believing I was a member of the mystical army of Ireland. And it was into the Hanini that you brought the Countess Markovitch? Yes. That was her initiation yes, into, that was the, her initiation. into the national movement. I got the idea of starting a woman's paper. And I saw her name amongst a list of people who had attended a Sinn Féin meeting in the Mansion House, uh, Arthur Griffith's organization. And I saw her name, and being a woman, I, I wrote to her at once and asked her, would she come and help on the Banner Heron, our little monthly journal? was a penny monthly, um, called Ban the Heron, Woman of Ireland. It was an odd kind of woman's paper, a funny hodgepodge of blood and thunder, high thinking and homemade brown bread. As Helena Maloney would later describe, a mixture of guns and chiffon. It is very unpleasant work killing slugs and snails, but let us not be daunted. A good nationalist should look upon slugs in the garden much in the same way as she looks on the British in Ireland. You had some distinguished contributors to it. You had Susan Mitchell, who was an assistant yes. to A.E., wrote, Raise from your knees, O daughters, raise. Yes, your right. mother still is young and fair. Let the world look into your eyes and see her beauty shining there. Grant of that beauty but one gleam. Heroes shall rise on every hill. Today shall be as yesterday. The red blood burns in Ireland still. The young working girls who joined in Ina were defying the norms of the day and risking their livelihoods by joining a nationalist organization. Membership was considered to be a treasonable activity for which they could be discharged immediately. 